side? Do I need headphones? No, you're good. Very nice. Everyone out there in the live stream, um, actually, if you had headphones, that would be great if you want to put those on. Uh, if you don't yeah. have them, it's super handy. It's fine. But it doesn't make a difference for StreamYard, but for Zencaster, it does. Hello, everyone out there in the live stream. So happy to have you here with us today. Rob, greetings all the way down in Australia. I love that place. It's been uh, too long since I've been to Sydney, and I haven't been in enough other places there. So, But thanks to the internet, we're there. All right, Rob. Are you ready to do this show? I am. Ready to tell the world about the Git folder and all the Git things? I hear it's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> all right. It definitely is. People are going to love it. Yeah. Rob, welcome to Talk Python to me. So glad to be here. I'm really excited that I get to uh, join you. Great to meet your audience. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you here. You got to meet probably a very small sliver of my audience, an intersection. You gave a talk at the Python Web Conference recently that I also spoke at. And your talk was really interesting and certainly relevant to the Python folks. So I thought it'd be cool to have you over here. And you know, I should give credit to Paul Everett for connecting us. He's like, oh, that was a great talk. You should go talk to Rob. So thanks, Paul, as well, who was not long ago on the show. Yeah, I've been chatting with Paul about thoughts around the talk as well. He's a really brilliant guy. Yeah, he is. He definitely is. He's been doing a lot of cool stuff for a long time. So yeah, he's, he's a great guy. Now, before we get into Git and all those types of things, which, you know, it's really surprising to me how much it's taken over the world, right? It used to be, there was always a question, well, what source control do you use? Like, that's not a question I hear all that often these days, not at least as much as it used to be. But before we dive into the details of that, let's start with your story. How'd you get into programming? This is actually a really fun story. Um, I was 10. I was at the library because they had the computer and we'd play video games. And, and the methodology of how you do this is you go up to the counter and you flip through the book and you go find the video game and you show them that page and they give you the disc and you, you the save icon. You take the save icon and you put it in the computer and you play the game. <laughs> so I'd finished playing my game and I went back to the desk to go pick in another one, flipping through the you know plastic sheets and uh, I found a drawing program. I said that I'd like to play this game. They gave me an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. The top two thirds was graph paper, you know, graphs. And the bottom third was how to write the program to draw that on screen. Oh, cool. And okay. It was so much fun. You know, I got to start to build content that was in my mind in real life in this, you know, this artistic medium with a very technical implementation. So, you know, that was so much fun. Um, I didn't ever return that game. <laughs> and so that kind of brought me into the world of software development. I always thought it was just a fun thing that people did. I didn't realize it was a career. So it wasn't until really late in my college experience when I realized that, you know, we I could do this for a career. And so after I graduated, I got into programming um, professionally. And w I've had a really fun time uh, coding now for uh, professionally for more than 20 years. Yeah, awesome. I think programming is special because it's one of those things you kind of hinted at where you, you think of something, you dream of something, you imagine something, and then with a little bit more thinking, that thing can become real. Whereas, you know, so much of what humans do, it's it's one or the other. I could tell an amazing story and write the book, or I could go build an awesome house. But normally those things don't actually coexist where you think a lot about something and they, they come into existence. But I do think that's a magical part of what we get to do. And you know, I think it captures a lot of people's imagination. And what's really cool is that in this digital world, there are a lot less boundaries, a lot less constraints. There's nothing telling me that this pixel needs to be in this certain way. I can draw whatever I want on these pixels on the screen. Yeah, yeah. And Modern day, we have cloud computing and we have incredible computers. Like the, the sky is the limit. It's really, really awesome. Uh, also, money, you don't have to go buy tons of hardware for many things that we do, right? So, really cool. Right. Now, how, how about today? What are you up to these days? I'm doing a lot with uh, software development, uh, cloud based development, um, a lot of websites, a lot of web properties. ASP.NET and Node on the back end, React and Vue on the front end, 
you know, taking that into interesting modalities. I've started to play with Raspberry Pis, and that's really fun. Mm -hmm. um, and and getting to dig into all the things. I've gotten really good at doing DevOps as well. Part of my passion is being able to share this knowledge with others. So I do a lot with teaching both um, at user groups and conferences and elsewhere, mentoring. And, and so it's really fun to be able to not only learn these new skills, but also pass it on to the next generation of developers too. I love yeah, to say okay. that um, it's not that I'm really good at it. It's just that I've been collecting things for a while. So let me add to your collection too. <laughs> Well, I think one of the things that's really interesting about becoming an expert in programming, people who are beginners or maybe don't do programming at all, they see that person as incredibly talented and incredibly smart. And they may be, they they often are, but I feel like the the real big difference is I've spent 10 years gathering up these little tips like, oh, I try this. That doesn't work very well. That crashes. You try to talk to the database that way. That's bad. Oh, by the way, I've also built up a, a couple of examples of what databases are. And I've seen all, you just have this. It's almost more experience than, I don't know, like innate skill, right? So it's really cool. That you can just kind of layer on these skills over your career. And the reason I think that's powerful is it's they're very easy to communicate back to other people, right? If, you know, the way... Nietzsche did philosophy or the way um, Euler did math, like you can't, or, or Bach did music, like you can't easily communicate that to someone. Like if it's this crazy innate skill, you can sort of communicate it, but it's not the same. But with programming, I think it's very, it's very easy to transmit it on and pass it on in, in ways to help people like level up. It's super fun. And it's really easy to get started. You know, programming languages have become much more approachable of late. And so if you're new to programming and just starting to dabble in it, you don't need to buy a big expensive thing. You know, the laptop that you're using to browse the web is probably sufficient for building simple programs. And so, you know, dive in, <laughs> yeah. uh, use well, free tools and, and just start building stuff. It's, it's really approachable and really fun. It absolutely is. And one of the things that just never ceases to blow my mind is I can be in a coffee shop working on a, a relatively cheap laptop doing my coding. Git push, speaking of Git, something happens in one part of the cloud. It triggers a webhook somewhere else that then grabs the code and could run that on a tremendously powerful data center and computer or suite of computers, a cluster of computers. And yet I get the experience of basically building this super powerful thing on my very wimpy little laptop. It, it It's just cool that you can you know, create things like, you know, Facebook or Google or you name it, these, these really large, amazing apps, but you could kind of just do it on like a laptop. Something that existed in my mind yesterday exists in the cloud and scaled to any user that wants it tomorrow. Yeah. That is really fun. Yeah, it's, it's super, super fun. Uh, before we move on, you also mentioned that you've been playing around with Raspberry Pis. Have you seen uh, something I covered recently on Python Bytes, my other podcast, is somebody built a water-cooled Raspberry Pi cluster computer. So eight Raspberry Pis mm -hmm. in one thing, all of them overclocked and water-cooled. <laughs> Have you seen people doing this stuff? It's crazy. It's really cool. And as you start to get into clustering programming, clustered programming, you know, multi-machine type of experiences, a Raspberry Pi is a really cheap barrier to entry. You know, for $40 yeah. or so, you can get a Raspberry Pi, get three or four or five of them, cluster them together, and now you get the sense of what does it take to build um, parallel machinery. And yeah. it is really, really fun. So, you know, to get an eight or 10 or 100 or 1,000 <laughs> <laughs> node Raspberry Pi is pretty sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you can do something similar with Docker, right? You fire up a bunch of Docker containers, but it's right. not the same feeling as like there's actually eight of them over there and they're actually talking to each other and working mm -hmm. together. I think it's it's a very different feeling. It's, it's super cool. All right. Containers so. do help us start to approximate that. But yeah, there is some lying to ourselves to believe that all of these containers running in context on my one laptop are really a distributed system. Yeah, absolutely. It's not the same, but it, it does let you sort of play around there a bit. 
Right. All right. So I, I want to talk about Git primarily, and that's what your presentation at the Python Web Conference was about. And that's what we're going to center our conversation on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you and I have both been around the industry for a while. Mm -hmm. Git is not that old. It's, it's the new source control on the block, I guess. So maybe let's talk a little bit about the history of source control, you know. And I, I think of source control as a spectrum from what source control? <laughs> all the way to, to get a distributed source control, maybe. You know, there's, I've talked to people and I've seen it in action. Source control is, I've got a file, a code file, and I've called it version one, version two, version two edited, version three, version three final, final two. You know, just like, or maybe if it's a lot of files, you zip the folder and you name it like that, right? Like that's the beginning of source control. I mean, it's doing it wrong, but it's getting, getting there, Whoa. right? It's it's doing it in exactly the way that you needed at that time. Copy folder versioning is definitely a thing. Dot bu, dot um, date, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, yeah. copy that content off to make sure that you have it. And that's really what we're after with version control. Is when we think of version control, we're really talking about two things. One is archiving the history of my journey so that I can get back to a known good state if things go bad, but also communicating with my team to be able to convey the progress of this system. Yeah. And copy folder versioning does the first one real well. It doesn't do the second one real well. There are systems that I've worked on where, you know, to upgrade the system is to first copy all the things into the dot backup <laughs> folder and then upgrade <laughs> the primary thing. And if it doesn't work correctly, then you quick, point quick, put the, it back, put it back, put it back. Yeah they point the web server at the backup folder. And so now the system has been running out of the backup folder for you know six or eight months or a year. And, and now we go to upgrade and step one is to take, oh, wait, we just took down the site. Now we have no yeah. known good backup things. Yeah, yeah, it's without some sort of source control, the real thing I think that falls apart Maybe you're doing the, the file versioning thing, which is still not that ideal. But the thing that really falls apart is collaboration. Right. Right. Soon as two people want to work on something, it's not okay to say, well, here's my zipped version. Can you merge that back together? And probably don't have merge tools either. So I, <laughs> what does that even mean? Right. So I quickly gets us into where I think people probably should be in some sort of version control. But back in the day, that was different stuff. For example, you know, yep. maybe that was subversion actually if you were on subversion you were in a good place i mean a really yeah, good subversion place Subversion was really cool subversion was an upgrade to cvs where yeah. cvs would version each file or each folder separately and so nested folders just happened to kind of be together in this clump and what subversion gave us was we're versioning the entire uh project together in one piece uh, before that we might have had uh source safe or other pieces um, team foundation server kind of fits into this realm as well. And so yeah. it's that mechanism of versioning all of the pieces together and then being able to publish that to a central place. What makes all of these systems kind of unique, uh, specific, is that they're all really client server pieces. So version yeah. was really good at being a client server piece. I would say it was, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was the best client server version control system that I'm aware of. I, yeah, I think, I think so. These systems, though, have kind of a fundamental flaw because we want to use version control for those two pieces. We want to use it to be able to back up the work so that I can get back to a known good state and to communicate with our team. And the hard part with these client server version control systems is we're doing both every time we commit. So when I commit a change to subversion, I'm immediately publishing it to all of you. So the analogy that I like is when I'm rock climbing, I want to be able to put a carabiner in the wall as frequently as possible. If I climb a foot and I fall, I'm only gonna fall a foot. If I climb six or eight or 12 feet and I fall, I'm gonna fall 12 feet. Well, actually, um, the nature of the rope is that it's going to swing all the way down. So I, I fall 24 feet <laughs> and Even that's worse. a long way to go. I want to stick pieces in the wall as frequently as I can. You don't want to see me spamming the thing every time I get there. 
So yeah. I get to the point where it's like, okay, I, I finished a thought. I'm good. I want to mark this save point, but I'm not ready to publish it to all of you. Yeah. And it's really the thing you the should be working with most of the time is if I publish it to the rest of the team, it should be, it should at least run, right? That probably yeah. the test should pass. Maybe you can fix that. Like you're going to work with somebody, but it shouldn't just mean nobody can build or even start the software at all because you've you've added the save point in the middle of their work that is inconsistent or halfway there or whatever, right? And so I've reached the stopping point, but I'm not done. It doesn't work. And so I have this moral dilemma. Do I mark a save point and inflict that on all of you <laughs> or do I not? And that's when I fall back to a secondary version control system where I start doing copy folder versioning again, <laughs> where it's mm -hmm. like, I just want to take all my stuff and stick it in this spot so that I have this known good state. And that's where we pivot to distributed version control systems, of which Git is one of them, where we have a separation between the commit stage and the publish stage. And that isn't the um, official terms that Git or any of the rest of them use, but there's a process of marking those save points. And then there's a process of collecting all of the save points and publishing them to others. And what's beautiful there that is takes that a bit of a I sorry just, that takes a bit of a mind shift to get used to it as well when you're working with it because if you come from one of these other systems I committed so it's saved right but commit in a distributed source control system means it's it's a local save point until you get push or whatever right. other immaterials equivalent of a get push is right yeah an hg push mm hmm and so it's exactly that. It's marking save points however frequently you want, and then combining those save points together into a cohesive story to publish to your colleagues. And that's what makes distributed version control so powerful, is separating those two concepts. Yeah. Mercurial, uh, Git, um, Perforce, <laughs> there are other distributed version control systems and as the world was moving from subversion and TFS into this distributed world, we experimented with each of them. You know, <laughs> arguably, Git wasn't the best. We might have done a VHS and Betamax type of thing. But uh, clearly, Git has become the de facto standard version control system. It is distributed. And now we can separate the save points from the publish points. Yeah. I think another really important thing to highlight for people who haven't been there, you know, right at the Git homepage, they highlight Subversion, which we in CVS, which we've been talking about, but Perforce, ClearCase, um, SourceSafe, uh, TFS, a lot of these things, there's, there's two things. One, they would lock files. Like if you wanted to make a change to a file, you would claim it. Like I'm editing main.py. Well, no one else can interact with that file. It's literally made read-only on your computer <coughs> until, you know, until that person is done. And they had better not forget and go on vacation while they got some files checked out, right? That's, that's the one thing. The other is you need permission to participate in a project. You, you have these gatekeepers and you need to sort of prove yourself to the gatekeepers. So if I wanted to commit, I wanted to work on Flask, if it was under subversion, I have to go. Can I have permission to go read, get read-only access to Flask? If I want to make a change, I literally have to say, I need permission to commit back to Flask. With the distributed ones, you clone it, you do your proof of work, your proposed idea, and if you want, you can contribute it back or you could just go in a different way, right? There's this very interesting separation of, I can kind of work on it and then see if I want to contribute it back rather than the other way around. I have to get permission to contribute. And I think that's a super critical thing in the open source space where there's a very loose coupling of people and projects. Like if somebody comes to me and says, I want to work on, I suppose I'm, I'm working on Flask. They come to me, I'm in charge of Flask. They come to me and say, I want to work on Flask. They're like, well, maybe. What else have you done? <laughs> Show me. This is a hugely no, used project. Yeah, it's, we do not want you to mess up Flask. What? And we had a little bit of that with SourceForge. You know, mm. you could clone the yep. repository in uh, Subversion and just work on it locally, but you weren't able to participate. The moment that you wanted to help, it, it was a really frictionful process where, you know, okay, so I have this diff. Now, I don't have write permissions, so am I going to 
you know, bake this diff into an email and hope somebody reads it? Um, do I just use it locally? Do I fork the project and only have our corporate version of it? You know, it was very difficult to participate. Yeah. And that's yeah. not a, a feature of Git per se, but rather the GitHub, the shared hosted mechanism around Git that has grown up as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with Git, you can clone a thing and then work on it as long as you have read right. access. But yeah, the the additional mechanisms, the Git flow around it is certainly something created by GitHub uh, with like PRs and, and forks and you know, merging upstreams and all that uh, origin upstream stuff. So I mean, one thing I did want to ask you before we get to the details is why do you think Git won? You did talk about this Betamax, VHS sort of thing, and there are other options out there for distributed source control. I, mean, I have a theory, but what are your thoughts? And I have a theory too, you know, I, I don't have the answer and maybe our listeners will help us discover what the correct answer is, or maybe there isn't one. In my mind, a lot of the time we were looking at ways to compete with things. You know, we had things that would compete with CFS or subversion because, you know, we wanted a little bit more or we wanted to make money on the process of source control. And what's really interesting about Git is that it, be, it has become so pervasive and so we're not building competitors to Git, we're building integrations into Git. All right, we're now, building arguably, Git, yeah. <laughs> GitHub helped with that too. GitHub was, has a really, really powerful um, community mechanism for that, and GitHub really only did Git. But I would argue that Git is really cool because it's free and open source. And because yeah. it's free and open source and it has that community mechanism around it, we don't need to compete with it. We don't need to try to make money on this. Um, instead, we can build collaborations with it and mechanisms for working with it and build up the community together. Yeah, uh, my my thought as well was GitHub, right? It's, yeah. it's the thing that brought not just the server infrastructure to privately have code, it brought the community and it brought the flow that allowed people to collaborate in ways that could let them collaborate once they've proven they have something to collaborate, right? Here's my PR where I've already shown you the thing that's amazing that I want to offer up to you. Oh, mm -hmm. well, that does look amazing. Thank you. Who are you? Let's let's talk about this, right? It's a different yeah. conversation than I've never seen you. Why should I give you right access to Flask on CVN? And it's uh, exactly SPN. that. GitHub has these magic levels to it, where at the very first level, it is just an online source code repository system. And so, you know, how is that different from SourceForge or TFS before it? And it isn't at this level. And so if that's what you're using GitHub for, then that's perfect. You know, back up your local projects up to GitHub, get your content off of your machine in case there's a disaster. That is definitely the first level. The next level starts to build workflows around it where we can say, um, I want to create issues. I want to create um, uh, project management things. I want to create milestones. I want to create goals. And, and so that's kind of the next level. Leveling up again, we can start to create a social community around that where um, we can start to have conversations around the content where I can create a, a diff and we can all talk about it and we can collaborate on it. And, and once it's good enough, now we can pull it in. Add to that then the mechanism around pull requests and things like that. Git has a content concept of push and pull. Um, you know, publish and receive, I guess, might be the terminology that matches here. And what's interesting about a pull request, I don't have right access to your repository, but I want to contribute. So instead of pushing my content to you, I am going to request that you pull it from me. And so no longer do I need to create this email and write out all the content and hope you read the email. <laughs> I create this code up in my space and I request that you include it in your space. And that made collaborating with projects really, really easy. So with that comes the next level of GitHub where we have these communities that can socialize and um, develop and um, hang out <laughs> in this coding space. And that's really what made GitHub so magical is that we have this community around coding 
where previously with um, SourceForge or other environments, yeah, we had that online source control system, but we didn't have those le levels of interaction. So pull yeah, requests absolutely. or merge requests or <laughs> whatever you're going to call it is that mechanism of being able to collaborate with low trust type of environments. I want to uh, offer up my solution to the community and see if that's going to fit into this ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's why I get one as well. And uh, Verda Rose uh, out there says, open source is the best way to learn and improve technically and collaborate with people you don't know. Yeah, and I, I think it's that the people that you don't know that makes it special because it allows you to create these connections with people all around the world who you would otherwise not meet and you get a yeah. chance to work with them. Even if you live in you know, rural Canada and you want to do software development, maybe no one around you is really good at whatever you're trying to do, but go to GitHub, find a project. You can collaborate with the best people in the world on that. We can yeah. create these communities around our passions for technology or the problems that we want to solve, not necessarily based on the geographic boundaries that we find ourselves in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I feel like that's that's the history of it a little bit. I yeah. talked a little bit on uh, why distributed source control is really powerful. And I think it it is really unlocked open source in a special way and I'm on a much larger mm -hmm. scale than it has. Um, and it is interesting to note that Git and GitHub are different. GitHub yeah. uses Git under the covers to be able to uh, build its social experiences. But Git is a thing that is separate and distinct. There is no pull request concept in Git, for example. And with Git on your local machine in a cave, <laughs> you can version and uh, create those save points. When you're ready to socialize, to publish your content, to communicate with your team, you can use Git together with lots of services, GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or there's lots of private services as well that allow you to create that online community. Now, <laughs> GitHub has published their magic sauce to the world and lots of us have cloned it. So um, GitHub is still the place where we code for the most part. But if you prefer coding in another community, then that's totally fine. You can still use Git and all of the tools to be able to version, create your save points and publish that content to others. You could just publish it to a different server as well. Git and GitHub yeah. are different. Yeah, and it's it's easy to see them as the same thing, uh, but yeah, they're absolutely not. Right, we've got all these different locations. You know, I have mixed emotions, mixed feelings about you know, if you have another project and you put it somewhere else. Uh, I'm not going to name any particular service, but let's just say somewhere that's not GitHub. You know, that's that's totally good, but at the same time, so much of the open source flow is around GitHub and the stuff that's happening there. It's, I don't know, it's just really interesting to think if, you know, why you might be at one place and not the other place and, and so on. Yeah. And a lot of people were worried when GitHub was bought by Microsoft, is this going to be the end of the community oh, yeah. collaboration? And I think Microsoft has been a really good steward of the GitHub community and really making sure that GitHub is still available to all of us and facilitating the success of that ecosystem. Yeah. I, there was a lot of hesitancy and concern uh, within certain communities. And I feel like they've done a great job. I, yeah. What I didn't realize was that GitHub really needed some help from somebody. Like they financially, they were not doing as well. I, I looked at them like, oh, this place must be incredibly successful. But it, you know, what came out after when some of the reports and stuff that was, you know, it, it was kind of important that someone came along and, if that's the case, then I was, you know, head over heels that Microsoft bought them. I last thing I want to see is them go away. And I think they've done a good job of just letting them be, right? Don't yeah, don't go mess exactly. with them. It's a real it's working really well. Um, so I think it's it's been a good a good deal that worked out there. See also Docker for an example of a community that is amazing and contributing, but doesn't have a financial business model to be able to survive. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully things go well for Docker, but it's it is tricky. They they tried the enterprise thing and then uh, they're yeah they're switching. I love to, their pivot uh, back to yeah. focusing on developers in the community, which is wonderful. But I still feel like they haven't found their spot that allows them to be uh, business successful. And the yeah. hard part is you can only do that for so long, and then you need to 
you know, pivot to something that can start to facilitate the business. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Are you ready to go into the Git folder and find where the hidden magic lives? Yes. No, if I, if I go to, this. yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, well, what I was going to say is if you go into a project that you've get cloned or you've get knitted and you create some files and you mess around there, you don't see anything different. It looks just like any other folder that might have a project in it. Right. Um, but in there actually is contained the almost the entire backup, the entire contents of all the versions of those files, at least every branch that you've checked out, hidden in the hidden.git file. So .git on... And it's um, not almost, it is. That is the <laughs> yeah. entire history of the project. So yeah. the way to back up a Git database, <laughs> misusing that term, is to grab that .git folder and copy it. Um, Inside that got, dot .git folder is lots of files that describe the history of the project um, since its inception down to the current version. And so, you know, kind of the only way that you can break Git is to open up that dot .git folder and change stuff. The cool part, though, is so that- So it's good that you want us to go in here and mess with it. That's- Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. By default, this folder is hidden on um, most systems. So you may have to show hidden files and folders to be able to see the .git folder. But it's there, yeah. and it's really powerful. Yeah, and so on Windows, you go to the Explorer, there's like one of those little ribbon things that drops down is a checkbox for show hidden folders and files. On Mac OS, I learned you can hit shift command dot and that will show hidden files. I, that I did not know, and I was very delightful when some user, delighted when users told me about that. On Linux, I don't know. I mean, you could go and do an LL in there on the terminal, but there's probably some way to show it in the Explorer equivalent as well. Yeah, but yeah, but even then if you'll it's just not find it in, um, you can navigate into it from your terminal or wherever. And once you're inside of it, yeah, all of the files are right there. Yeah, so we go in here, we find things like head, config, description, hooks, index, info, logs, objects, packed refs, and refs. You want to maybe give us a, a rundown of what each one of these are, and then we will we can dive deeper with one of the tools that you built into maybe some of things like refs and, and so on. But yeah, that also yeah. maybe hook. But yeah, wherever you want to start. What's cool in this database in here? is it is the entire history of your project, and it's Zlib compressed. So, for example, the 20 year history of Perl, the .git folder is ever so slightly larger than the checkout folder. And that includes the entire history, including all of the changes and all of the authors and all, all of that is really nicely compressed into this folder. Wow. It breaks down into a couple of groups of things. We have the content, we have uh, branches and tags, you know, references to the content. We have configuration details around this repository. We have index files, we have temp files, and then we have automation tools. And so these are kind of the groups of things that we'll find in this folder. A lot of them happen to be in their own folder, which is really nice. So for example, hooks is the place that you go for automation. Refs is the place where all of the content is. Um, uh, uh, no, refs is the place for branches. Objects is the place for the content. And so a lot of the things that we'll see will have their own folder, but some of them spill out. Like configuration is in the config file, but there's also some stuff in the info folder for that. Um, indexes, we've got the index file right there on the root directory, but we also end up with index files inside of uh, pack folders. And so you know, it gets a little right. bit interesting. The yeah, first so one that's really about... yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead. The first one to dive into is probably the objects folder, because this is the stash of all of the content in your repository. Now, as you commit something into Git, you'll first add it to the staging area, and then you'll commit it with a message. And as you do so, you'll end up with content inside the objects folder. Now, what's interesting to note here is if you look at a Git log, you'll see a hexadecimal thing. You know, It might be seven characters, or it might be much longer than that. And as you 
uh, do that log, you can take a look at that. Inside the objects folder are folders with two digits. Those are the first two digits of the commit number. Inside that folder is all of the um, commits that happen to start with that um, two-digit number or letter. So you know that means that not all of the files will be in one directory. They'll kind of be um, arranged a little bit. That gets around too many files in one directory errors. But it's that um, dot get uh, that objects folder that then stores all of the content there. Now what's interesting is I think of it. You know, I if I commit one, and that's where this talk was really cool. When I commit one thing and I go look in that objects folder, I will have three different files. Now they are zlib compressed, so <laughs> I do a yeah. Cool you can't just open I... them up and 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 look at them, right? They're kind of right scrambled up. But it's not magic, you know. If uh, I built a tool that will unzlib compress one, which is pretty cool. Um, but once we identify a thing that we want to do, we can also use git cat file. Git cat file allows us to look at both the type and the content in a particular node. Now, this is a directional acyclical graph nodes, <laughs> DAG nodes, that specify relationships between these things. But what's cool is we- Here's a branch. Our... Here's, an, uh, here's a, a file that's in that branch, something like that. They're not branches, but they are folders. Here's a file within a folder. Here's um, the content. So we have three different types of these nodes. One is a commit. And in the commit, we have uh, the author's name and the date that it was committed, the message that we gave. And also in that commit is a reference to the tree nodes that are part of that commit. Now, each tree node can specify files or folders. So a tree node can reference another tree node. And inside the, the tree node, we have references to those files. So I might have a tree node that references file1.txt. The third type is a blob. And so as we look at blobs, then that's the actual content in the thing. So um, go back to the, uh, click on, um, uh, oh, I don't think I have a, a one to get back to the blob. But the cool part about this app, hit refresh, and you'll get to that big blob of stuff. Here's all of the yeah, let, commits so in this So I, I jumped ahead so we had something visually to look at here, and it's about to pull up its rendering. Um, you built yeah, this thing called Git. That's all right. You built this thing called Git-Explorer, which is a little web app that runs that you pointed at a Git repository, and it lets you look at these things that you're describing visually and then click around on them, right? Right. So click on show type and we see the three different colors emerge. There are commits, trees, and blobs. And it's like, okay, I have a whole bunch of files in my um, objects folder and I can click on each one and I'll use that git cat file thing to go figure out what it is. But it's like, you know, I really wish I had more stuff about it. And so that's where I click alphabetical and that will put them all in order. Click on tags, and now you can see the um, name of that thing. And I'm only showing the first wow. seven digits of the commit here, but now you can kind of get a sense for here are all the objects and, and click on each one and open it up. Right, and these names the are, are what often go by SHAs in Git yeah. parlance, which is just the, the type of hash, SHA, whatever it is. And I don't know how many people know this, but you can use sub pieces of the SHA to refer to it in Git. So you don't have to say the full, what is that, 32 characters or whatever to describe a name. As long as it's enough to be unique, it'll go, like you can issue commands against these things in this abbreviated form, right? Right, exactly. So oftentimes only two digits is necessary sometimes three or four. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> yeah. often when you're looking at Git history, it'll only show you the first seven. Because yeah, that's, that's sure, surely enough. enough. Yeah. Now what we start to do as we're clicking through this is we get a feel for all of these green nodes. That's the content in the files. The blue nodes are the tree nodes. And as I click on one of those blue tree nodes, then it references other files. I can see there uh, SHAs, their Git hashes there in that list. 
And then as I look at the red ones, the commits, though that's my commit message that includes the um, parent node that uh, was the commit right before this. It also references the tree node that has the files for this. And so wouldn't it be nice if we could, I don't know, arrange them in a way. So let's, instead of going from alphabetical, let's click on parent child and start to see the relationships. We'll need to turn on lines now, and we probably want to also turn on tags. And now we can take a look at those commits and see how each one references. Now, if you have a very large repository, <laughs> shoots off. <laughs> then uh, I haven't built scrolling yet, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but right. you can see that the red commit nodes all reference each other and or reference the previous ones. And then they go into these, these tree nodes that may reference other tree nodes. And eventually those reference the file nodes. As part yeah. of my demo, I highlight that if we create the same file content and commit it in two different directories, it's actually only one blob on disk. There's only one green blob node. But the yeah. cool part here is we were able to explore each of these objects in our repository, and we get a feel for how they work. So if I change one line in a very big file, what gets committed? Well, the entire file. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I suspect that's probably why uh, large binary files are not ideal to be committed here, even though you technically can put them there. Right. So that's yeah. the first group of things is these objects. And yeah, that's the, the objects folder in there. Wanna... Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh, that, so that's the top level objects folder in the dot git uh, folder. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Now, there is a pack folder inside there. If you run various commands, then Git will say, well, do I have too many um, commits, too many of these objects that I need to you know, pack together to make this uh, repository smaller on disk? And if so, then it'll automatically do a GC, a garbage collect, <laughs> where it starts to uh, pack those into pack files. Now, it's kind of a zlib compressed group of zlib compressed files. <laughs> so it gets very meta there. But that's what the pack folder is inside the objects folder. Yeah. OK. So next up, let's talk about the refs folder. Now, when we look at refs, we look at branches and tags and remotes. These are files that reference commits. So uh, one example is the head folder in the root of the .git directory. And inside that head folder, it will specify what head points to. So if you do a git log and you see that head has an arrow pointing to, I don't know, main or trunk or develop or whatever, then if you open up that head file, you'll see the text in that file is that, that file. It's uh, basically the, the SHA, right? Is that what it is? It is the SHA if your head is pointing at a SHA. But typically, uh, okay. your head won't be pointing at a SHA. It'll be pointing at a branch. Oh, yeah. Refs, mine right now is refs slash heads slash main, which is the default right. branch for this project. So that's main awesome. The branch. Yeah. Head says it goes to refs, heads, main. So we can go into the refs folder. We can go into the heads folder. And we can open up main. And what's in main is the SHA of the commit that main points to. OK. What's cool here is that each of these refs, both head and all of these branches, is just pointers to the commits in the objects folder. Yeah, so these are like the, the uh, what is it? The, the main file is just a text file that just literally has only the SHA that is where that branch currently is. Exactly. OK. So technically, to create a branch, I just create a file that happens to be in refs, heads. I name it something, and I give it a SHA. And now I have a branch that points at that thing. Branches in Git are not these durable, fragile things like in TFS or in Subversion. Uh, branches in Git are just name tags. They're pointers. They're references to the commits in this tree of objects. So right, the cool thing is we can move these around. Named, these named commits through the history of the overall history of it, right? Right. 
they're the labels that we give it so that we can understand it because communicating in 32 digit SHAs is um, <laughs> not as much fun. No, definitely not. Definitely not. One of the talks that I like to do is I do a git log and I show that um, 32 digit hash and I, I read it out and then I walk up to somebody in the audience and, and pretend they're the project manager and I go, can I ship it? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, uh, uh, yeah. Thus, we have these labels. Yeah, now, that's right. in the heads folder is all of the branches. In the tags folder is all of the tags and they're also Sorry, my, my uh, repo is empty i don't have any but if you you know people might tag a release or a version or a beta version or something like that so you can refer to it by name by label instead of you know main with a shaw or something weird like that right right and then we have a remotes folder which references where i last saw another copy of this git repositories branches yep So in this case, you have one that says refs, remotes, origin, main, and that's perfect. That's where I last saw this server, um, this server's head, uh, main direct, uh, main branch. Now in I this see. case, I chose to call my main, my remote server origin. Now this could be a server that we've designated as the server. It could be one of my coworkers. It could be a network share. You know, Git isn't really opinionated about what constitutes a remote repository other than that it isn't this one. Yeah. Okay. How does it know which what origin is? As I create a remote, I'm going to name it. Okay. So as I clone, I'm going to say git clone this repository and it'll build one and it'll by default call it origin. But I could also say git remote add origin, I just gave it a name, and yeah. then give it a URL. I could say git remote add upstream. I could say git remote add Michael. <laughs> now it's a re reference from my repository to yours. And so it's just, in this case, in the refs remotes folder, it's just a folder referencing the branches that I saw on your machine. Nice. Is there somewhere where it stores like the URL? It does. And that is the next section that we may want to look at, which is configuration. Let's right. open up the config file in the root of the .git folder. Uh, right. Now, this configuration file is really cool. It includes all kinds of configuration details associated with our repository. Now, in this case, we have remote origin, where <laughs> we've named this one, and here's the URLs that we go to there. Uh, in this case, it's github.com slash talkpython. Um, we have other configuration details associated with this repository. Uh, we This .git config file is actually one of three on my machine. And we'll start out with our config file in that's installed when we install git. So it's probably in program files, or it's in user local bin, or you know somewhere off in the ether of how we install it. We probably don't want to touch that one. But that's the base configuration of all the options that we chose when we installed Git. So if I run a command, if I were to say something like, you know, Git email global, something like that, you know, with the dash G command, maybe it's modifying that one. Well, the one that we just talked about was the system one. The second one is the global one, which is user specific. Yeah. I find that name a little confusing. Yeah. But my user specific, the dot git config in my user home directory, so you know, C users Rob or uh, user um, or the tilde slash directory on Mac and Linux, that dot git config overrides any settings in my system configuration. And so oftentimes when you first install Git, you'll say git config dash global user dot email user dot name. And so if you open up that um, yep. dot git config in your user home directory, you'll see those settings. You'll see your username, your uh, name, <laughs> your email, and all of the details that you've configured there. And then the third one is the config file here in your repository that will override any of those settings. 
So it doesn't make sense for us to have origin in our system, in our user-specific configuration file, because, well, each repository will have a different origin. But it probably does make sense to put our name and email in our system, in our user-specific directory, because that would apply to all the repositories on our machine. Yeah, absolutely. O almost all of them. You might be doing home-based open source work, and you might be doing corporate button-up work, and your formal corporate place might not love your corporate email on the open source project. Or maybe you don't exactly. want that. Yeah. So when I have that scenario where I need to set my email address, or maybe my name differently in different repositories, I can set it in my .git config in my user home directory, and then I can override it in each repository. Just copy those couple of lines, set them in your config file here, and now you've set this repository to track your email differently. Is there a git command to change it? So I, I don't actually go into the .git folder and I say like git email, but not global or git config. Yeah, email. leave off the dash dash global. Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't even have to know how. You just know I do uh, you know, git email and what my email is. Right. Yeah, now, there are config other email. configuration files here in the .git folder, but the config file is really the big one that we like to talk about. Yeah. Okay. But you'll see a description file here. That's a configuration file. Git InstaWeb is a web server baked into Git that allows you to kind of browse through your repository. Now, Git InstaWeb works pretty well on Linux and not so great on Windows. I bet you've never used Insta, Git InstaWeb in most I'd never scenarios. heard of it until you brought it up the other day. Yeah, but this configuration file is the name of the uh, website when you launch Git InstaWeb. Yeah, so Git ships with a web server that can be the host of that Git repository. Yeah. Now, why would I ever do that? Why wouldn't I just use GitHub? Exactly, which is why you've never heard of Git InstaWeb. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you might say we want a private Git server or a public Git server or something like that. That might be, but yeah, usually, uh, yeah, I've never heard of it. So very interesting. Yeah. All right, what else We've is in this, this list here? In yeah. Objects folder. We've talked about the branches and tags in the REST folder. We've talked about configuration. Let's go poke in the hooks folder. Oh, the hooks, hooks folder is yeah, where hooks we is do interesting. automation. Yeah, it is really cool. Yeah, so people probably heard of pre-commit hooks, right? Like I, probably the most popular example in the Python space is to run the black formatter. So it automatically formats your code before it checks it in. So indentation, white space, like between a comma and an argument or something, it's always consistent so you don't get these like back and forth editor-driven, you know, merge issues. When there's no real change, but... You know, I, I right. format it in my editor, you format it in yours, and back and forth it goes between spaces with the comma, no spaces with the comma, spaces with the comma. And so you could set up a pre-commit hook to canonicalize it before it goes in. Right. But there's more I than pre-commit, right? A, yeah, I could set up a pre-commit hook to make sure all my unit tests pass before I commit. I could set up... And so what we see here in this hooks directory is all different kinds of... Um, automation things. So a pre-commit hook, a pre-merge hook, a pre-push hook, a pre-rebase hook. And each of these are shell scripts. Well, with one exception, it's a Perl script. But you see at the very top, it says slash bin slash sh. Well, I'm on a Windows box. Is this shell script still going to work? Well, yeah. Git ships with enough Linuxy, Unixy, Bash-like stuff to be able to kick off these shell scripts and run them as it would on any Linux system. Okay. And then here so in this shell basically script, like a little mini bash that, that comes with it. I remember people using that bash shell from Git to be more Unix-like on Windows. Exactly. So here in this shell script, I could do all kinds of things. Maybe I'm calling a PowerShell script. Maybe I'm calling a Python script. Maybe I'm calling a node formatter. I can just call into whatever tasks I want to accomplish, and that will then accomplish that task whenever this event happens. 
So what I love to do in my demo is remove all the dot sample pieces so that they're actual scripts. And then just merely the presence of that file will be able to kick off that automation. All right, so, so there's a bunch of files that are sample shell scripts named things like pre-commit.sample or pre-merge commit sample. If I just called it pre-commit but not the dot .sample, now it's gonna be active? Exactly. Okay, nice. Now the cool part about these is that I have all my automation set up. Um, I'm running the formatters, I've got my unit test passing and it's great, but this file is inside my .git folder. So I can't commit these. It's not one of the files that is available for me to add to the staging area. All right. You, it would be it would be inception if you tried to commit stuff in the .git folder. Right. So often we'll create shell scripts outside the .git folder and commit them, and then have something here inside the .git folder that calls into that other shell script. Yeah, and There's you mentioned some kind of node-based tool that you can use, right? Um, that will manage that stuff, right? Right. There's lots of packages. The one that I show is um, uh, Git Hooks, that is an NPM package. And once you install Git Hooks, it will actually create all those aliases from uh, the folder where you actually build the scripts that you can commit into this Hooks directory, so that then they'll run. Just installing this package install the, installs those hooks into place. I see. So basically, if you just install the package once, it will find those other external scripts and make those be the ones that get Cs with the advantage that you can commit them into GitHub. And if somebody makes a change, that change will propagate to everyone else. Yes. Like, you can yeah, commit okay. them into Git, push them up to GitHub, and they will run. OK. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, very neat, very neat. OK, what else have we got here? What else have so we, got? we looked maybe through. Index, maybe that's an interesting one. Yeah, index is really interesting. Um, as we look through index, if we just pop it open in an editor, it's just a bunch of gobbledygook. And we're like, what is this? It's a file, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This isn't the only index, but this is one of the really cool indexes where Git keeps nice. track of interesting stuff. Yeah, if check I, out if I this. I try to look up. at it, it's like a it's like a binary blob exploded and died on my terminal. But there are file names in there somewhere, <laughs> so it must be something to do with that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm I'm not remembering the command where you can go um, look. Uh, I think it's git ls files, where you can go look through this index. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> we can't run it. It's ls files. Uh, all one word. Yeah, there we go. And if we pass in flags to that, then it'll be able to show the status of those files. But this is looking through that index. And the cool part about looking through that index is that um, Git, if it wants to do a quick thing like which files have changed, needs to know the blob that is checked out in my working directory. You know, which blob right. did I start with? As we look through those objects, we saw a big tree of things. And, and so opening up each commit node, finding all the tree nodes, opening up each tree node, finding all of the blob nodes, that takes a while. And so this is a cache, an index, of all the files that I checked out in my working directory. This allows Git to move really fast as it looks through my, um, my folder and identifies any files that have changed or new files or things like that. So that's what this index file is for. Yeah, and my Git incantations are not pulling it up here, but I'm, I think you can get it to show the SHA of each file as well, right? Right. In, in which case, then instead of traversing the whole history and actually look at the file on the hard drive and saying, well, what is its hash? Do I have an update for this file? And I could just look in this binary file and get that answer, right? Exactly. Nice. Yeah. One of the files, yeah. um, 
The next section of files that we want to look at are logs. And the cool thing about Git's logs is they keep track of where all of our branches have been. So if we cat um, .git slash log slash head, then we get a thing that kind of looks really weird. We've got really long lines in this. And in our first line, it says whole bunch of zeros, space, and then we've got the git sha of the commit that it went to and a little bit about that commit. This is a log of where our branches have been. And so we'll have a file for each of our branches. In this case, we're looking at the head file. So we see that head started out nowhere and ended up at ed13fc. Now the really interesting- My username, my email, and then some other mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. The really interesting thing is this log can be really useful if, for example, I switch branches and forgot where I was, or I commit something and then I uncommit it, <laughs> that's a thing, and I want to get back to it, or I delete a branch before I merged it in, or you know those types of things. If I do that quickly enough, you know, remember Git's going to do that garbage collect and go prune nodes that aren't used anymore. If I get there quickly enough, I can use this log to go back through my refs and go find that commit. The objects are still there. I just don't have any refs pointing to them anymore. And so the command that we can use on the command line is called git ref log. And we can pass git ref log a particular branch we want to look at. But by default, if we just say git ref log, all one word, then it will show the history of head. Now, in this oh, case, yeah. we didn't move it very far, <laughs> but <laughs> we can see there, oh, and here's the branch that I just deleted, and here's the uh, SHA for this one. And so at that point, then we can git check out that commit and get back to the content that we had created and then lost the reference to. Right. Okay. Nice. There's a little bit of recovery, uh, kind of an undelete if you had to in there. Yeah. Nice. The, right, the well, funny thing about this, the command is git ref log, but I've also heard it pronounced git ref log. And I'm like, <laughs> so I've got this cat of nine tails and I'm like, no, you can't git ref log. Exactly. Do it again. But once you understand how the refs folder works, then git ref log makes a whole lot of sense. We're looking yeah. at what those ref files have said in the past. Here's what yeah. it was before we changed it. Here's what it became after we changed it, and a little bit more context yeah. around it. Where you're currently working is where the head is pointing. Often that's some point yes. in a branch. And this is like, where's the history of that bin throughout the branch that it's on? Yes. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So we're getting sort of short on time here. What else should we be talking about? Like, What else you know, sort of should we close this out with in terms of content of our dot get file get, get the only other section in here is temp files so if we've committed stuff we might see a commit underscore msg file or maybe it's called commit underscore message <laughs> we might see other temp files we have a temp folder sometimes baked into things and so that's the last group of files here in the dot git folder uh, is temp files temp files configuration objects refs, hooks. These are all the pieces that come together to make this Git database. And once nice. again, you really can't break Git. You know, It's like, well, I did this incantation and it's broken. Well, no, you can use ref log to get back to a particular commit, or you can use various commands, check out um, to get back to where you need to. Maybe you'll use reset to you know, kind of get your working directory back in shape. But that structure of Git, <laughs> the double entry bookkeeping inside yeah. this repository, is really good at keeping track of the things. And so you really can't break Git. Yeah. And back this up, you back it up, right? You back up this folder, you back up yes. basically everything, right? Now, right. it might be easier to back it up not by just backing up this folder, but by publishing your changes to another repository. And that's where we have great workflows. Like I will push all of these changes to another server. Maybe I'll call that server origin.
yeah, absolutely. And and that's automatic if you check out from somewhere like clone it from somewhere like Git. Right. Like GitHub. So there's just a couple other things maybe I want to touch on really quickly while we have a moment. When you talked about breaking Git, there's an interesting little design thing <laughs> called dang it git or even better uh, maybe i'll link to the better version the not safe yes. for work version where you're frustrated and it's like oh no i i just did something terribly wrong please tell me how to do it and reflog is right at the top of, of these things i i committed and immediately realized i need to make a change or i need to change my commit message and yeah anyway that's a pretty interesting one another thing we've talked a lot about github and what we haven't really talked about at all really and is git ignore Right. As much as you want to track stuff, you don't want to automatically track a bunch of things that are working files. Um, you know, build stuff from C plus plus, or maybe under Node underscore modules, or you know, PyCharm working files, or all sorts of things should not go into your project. Right. Your VNF directory. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. Your VNF directory. Absolutely. So yeah. There's Git any ignored. content that you download, any content that you create, uh, that you compile, any of that content shouldn't be in your repository because it changes too infrequently. And it's usually easier to either rebuild it or redownload it. All yeah, those things a, should be ignored. Yeah, and it's a huge merge nightmare as well. Even if you could keep it right, suppose I check in my VMF directory and you go on Windows, well, you can't have the same contents as mine because mine is the Mac OS version. So you change it, put your Windows version in there, and I get it back out, and it breaks my Mac versions. Like, right, those, so there's stuff you should ignore, absolutely. And when you create a new project on GitHub, it very handily says, hey, what kind of project is this? We can get you far down the road with your Git ignore. Is this a Python project? Is it a Node project or whatever, right? What I wanted to point out is that dropdown list, there's actually a GitHub project called Git Ignore that has the ignore for all of these different languages. So if you want to make a change to, say, Python's Git Ignore, you can go there and pull it up and see it. And you could technically do a PR against it to say there's this new thing that's common in the community now. Please fix it. That's pretty cool. And these things aren't perfect. You know, most of them will exclude everything that starts with or ends with or contains log. But your iLogger or your log handler yep. might get excluded by that as well. So you may need to adjust this to get it the way you want. Yeah, but it is nice to know that at least it, it'll give you a bit of a start and that it's it's a thing that you can contribute back to. It's not just magic inside of GitHub, but it's its own GitHub open source repository. Right. Yeah. Quite neat. Quite neat. Uh, let's see. What else should we cover really quick? I think maybe just one other thing I think that's maybe worth throwing out there that was interesting, but it's it's pretty specific. But you've mentioned Windows a, a couple of times. Um, maybe two things, actually. One is on the shell that you saw on my screen just a minute ago, when I was inside of a Git repository, it would actually put what branch it was on and the git state and so on. And I have that because I have oh my Z shell installed, which is a really nice shell for Mac and Linux that gives you things like branch awareness and number of changes and so on. I saw at your talk you had something like that for PowerShell, the new Microsoft terminal. What were you using for right. that one? It's called oh my posh. And oh Scott posh. Henselman has a really cool video about Oh My Posh where he walks us through how to get it installed. There are various themes into Oh My Posh, but the theme that I really enjoy actually puts the cursor on the next line. Um, one of the things that I frequently do in command prompt is, you know, I have all of the path to get to this folder. And so the command that I'm trying to teach ends up getting wrapped to the next line. And so Oh My Posh or Oh My ZSH gives you that additional context of how's your Git repository doing? You could also show your remote. It's basically just running a shell script behind the scenes. And so you can modify that shell script. Um, Scott Hanselman is diabetic and so needs to check his blood sugar a lot. And so he actually has built into his Oh My Posh script, his blood sugar number because it's really wow. easy to miss. And it's one of those things that's really important not to miss. So it's Probably in his color code it, all right? the time. Out of, out of range, make it red. If it's not out of range, you make it green, something like that. Yes. Oh, wow, how interesting. 
yeah, this looks fantastic. I've never played with this before, but yeah, it looks, looks really nice. You recommend it? Yeah, I do. Cool, cool. All right. Well, I guess the one other thing that I was going to throw out there is I heard of this thing called VSF for Git. Talked about large files. And this, this sounds like it's very much a Windows only thing. But it's a neat idea, this virtual file system for Git that if you have a really large repository, it's kind of like the smart sync for Dropbox or something. It only pulls the files and interacts with the files that you actually touch, but it does that behind the scenes without you knowing it. Have you seen this? Yeah. And we actually said VSF for Git, but it's actually VFS for Git, virtual file system. It's yep. great when your repository is just massively huge. And 98% of our repositories are not. But when you have yeah. the code base of, I don't know, Windows, <laughs> then yeah. you need something like this because you can't Git clone the entire thing. Um, GitHub, not GitHub, Google is famous for having their corporate mono repo. And I suspect that's bigger than it than you could Git clone onto each machine as well. And so the cool part is uh, one of the benefits of subversion that we lost as we moved to Git was I could clone only part of a repository. And VFS kind of gives us that ability back. Most of the time we don't need it, but if you've been re <laughs> really bad and you've committed a whole bunch of binary files to your repository, eh, it's interesting. It might be worth kicking the tires. It isn't necessarily Windows only. It is a plugin to Git itself, but it allows you to put that checkout directory somewhere else. So for example, on a shared file, a uh, shared network drive. Now I have all of those objects, all of those blobs in one place, and I don't need to copy each of those to my machine. Yeah, interesting. The The Windows people that were switching to Git said it was really a nightmare. So for example, the source code for Linux repo is something like 600 megs or 0.6 gigs. Windows is like 270 gigs, so it's really ginormous. And they said to do a clone took 12 hours, to do a checkout took three hours, to do a get status took eight minutes, and to do an add and commit took 30 minutes before they made this change. So they were suffering some hard pains to uh, go down this, this path for sure. I guess it, it probably is worth it for them. Right. All right. Well, let's, I guess we probably should put a bow on it. We're more or less out of time there, Rob, but. Yeah, uh, I'll ask you the two questions I always ask at the end of the show. Uh, if you're going to write some code, what editor do you use? It depends on the code that I'm trying to write. In most cases, I'll reach for VS Code, but I'll also reach for Visual Studio. Right. Um, sometimes I'm also stuff, known like to reach for... Oh, sorry, go ahead. If you're doing like ASP.NET or something you were talking about like that or something you got, right. I mean, maybe something like WPF where the tools are built in, you have to basically, not have to, almost have yeah. to use them. But sometimes I also reach for Sublime Text or Text Edit. Okay. Cool, cool. And then I uh, often ask for a Python package library recommendation. Um, maybe we could make it your Git script, uh, the, the one that runs the pre-commit stuff, the one that moves that outside the Git folder. What was that called again? It's called Git Hooks. And Git Hooks. let me grab a link to it. It's actually a node package, but exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you just install it wherever and it's it's good to go, right? Yes. And so if you have maybe a Flask server and you want to, um, and as part of your Flask server, maybe you have a React or a Vue app where you need to pull down jQuery as part of your client-side dependencies, then you may have enough Node stuff to be able to leverage this as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you're already using NPM because you're doing front-end stuff, then you might as well, right? Yes. Yeah, very cool. One of the things that we didn't talk about, and it's really cool how this happened, Git workflows. What's beautiful about Git is it's really unopinionated about how you do your workflow. Are you going to do Git flow? Are you going to do GitHub flow? Are you going to do something else? Git can work for all of those scenarios because it is just a mechanism of committing and sharing files. It doesn't impose a specific branching or naming convention. You can choose to put those on top, but Git's um, workflow is really open to whatever you need it to do. Yeah, well, when I was first getting familiar with 
this whole PRs and, and merging and, and those kinds of things, I felt like, oh, that's a Git thing. That's a GitHub thing. It has nothing to do with Git, right? It just Git facilitates yes. that on top of it. So you can choose however you want to work, right? Right. Quite cool. All right. Well, I don't normally close out this show with a joke, but Robert uh, Robinson had a good one here in the live stream. So I'm going to put this up here for us as our, our parting thought, and then I'll ask you for one more as well, maybe. Yeah. So he said, um, there's a programmer who once told him, couldn't use Git. He was afraid to commit. Huh. <laughs> afraid of he was afraid of the git commitment oh that's awesome <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. thank you for that thanks for making us laugh all right final call yeah. to action people want to go a little bit deeper than git maybe they just do the three commands git clone you know git i don't know git add git commit git push like that's four commands like beyond that like how do you get more into this world What's really interesting is as we're coming off of those other systems, we want to kind of build up that tribal knowledge that we had. And so we're going to go grab those three or five commands and we're going to stick them to the post-it under our keyboard. Take the next step to go figure out, you know, what is the next command that I want to do? Or how does this command work? What we did today was we explored through that .git folder so that we could take that next level to see how it works. Git isn't a black box. It's not uh, magic. It just works a little bit differently than the source control system you might have been familiar with. So definitely get familiar with it. Google the terms that you're looking for and uh, really start to embrace that mechanism and get really powerful with Git. I'm confident that you can get past just those few commands and you can make it just an inherent process in your workflow and use it to be really, really powerful. Specifically, separating the save points from the publish points. That's the thing you couldn't do before that you can now yeah. do with Git. Yeah, well said. Definitely agree with all of that. I think getting really good with source control and source control these days really means Git almost. It mm -hmm. allows you to be fearless with your code, right? So often people are like, oh, I would like to try this, but what if I break it? What if it doesn't go right? Well, if you know how to, you know, create your branches, work locally, do all sorts of stuff, roll back. You can just go crazy and just explore things. And if it doesn't work, you know, throw it away. No harm, no foul. It's lovely. And if you get really stuck, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich and show me the code where you got stuck and let's get you unstuck because I would love to continue this conversation and really help you be successful. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time and being here. It's been great to chat, get with you. Most definitely. Thanks for having me yeah. on. Yeah. See you later. And thank you to everyone in the live stream for being here. It was really great. Uh, we will catch you next time.